think we're lost. Uh, no, dear. Uh, here's the sign now. Drive-in radio theater this way. drive-in radio theater. Oh. Uh, listen. It's Ruby's drive-in radio theater. A coffee hot! It's here, now. Philboid Studge Mark IV XL7. Command Performance. Good evening, I'm Alastair Croc. Welcome to the third in our series of extremely minor operas by measurably obscure Italian composers. Tonight we present La Storia Imbecille by Giovanni Battista di Pozzo. In Act One, the Duke, who has usurped his now peasant brother's throne and seduced his half-sister Caterina, contrives against his stepfather, the Archbishop, unrelenting in his pursuit of the Duke's present wife, Lucia, who for her part has eyes only for her brother-in-law's valet, Felatio, unknown to all the actual husband of his daughter's best friend, Cretina, presently lamenting her unrequited love for Caterina's uncle, Testosterone, recently escaped from imprisonment and forced to remain in disguise as Lucia's mother, causing Cretina to reveal it to Astolfo that she is in fact her own niece. In scene two... <laughs> So that's me loss, that's me loss, that's me loss. I warm so easy, so that's me loss. It shines so bright the more. Don't hold my arm so extra out, extra out, extra out. Don't hold my arm so extra out. It makes so good to sport. Thanks for taking care of the kids, Mom. No problem, honey. You know, I couldn't help noticing. Billy sure looks pale. Has he been getting his Philboid studge? None of that newfangled stuff at our house. Good old-fashioned oatmeal was good enough for me, and it's good enough for Billy. 
But dear, Philboid Studge has more vitamins and essential nutrients than a hundred bowls of oatmeal, and it can help cut down on smeary, waxy buildup while killing household germs and odors on contact. Here, watch. See, the leading brand goes on harsh and gray. But Philboid Studge leaves Billy's towel smelling fresh and clean. And it even leaves my dry, rough skin so soft and moist. You're right as usual, Mom. Philboid Studge beats even my oatmeal. It really is a young mother's best friend. What about me? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing beats the down-to-earth goodness and proven protection of Philboid Studge. We're here in Berkeley, California at Edie's, one of the world's fine restaurants. We've secretly replaced the fine coffee they usually serve with Philboid Studge. Will it be rich enough? Let's listen in to what the patrons are saying through our hidden microphones. To have is to have. For it's a figure in rhetoric that drink being poured out of a cup into a glass by filling the one doth empty the other. For all your writers do consent that Ipsy is he. Now, you are not Ipsy. I am he. There you have it, another unsolicited testimonial for Philboid Studge, rich enough to be served in America's finest restaurants. Every time you step out under the shimmering of satin, under the sleekness of silk, the secret you, the essence of you, let Philboid help you share that secret with someone special. Philboid, an irresistible studge. Lavish it all over your body. Unfold into wave after wave of sensuality. Every time you want to share your secret, Phil Boyd Studge, for the essence of you. Good evening, and welcome to the Oxen's Three Noses. I'll be your waiter this evening. My name is Charlie, but you can call me Jean-Claude Charles-Pierre. <laughs> Our special tonight is Heart of Wildebeest. Lavished in a lightly curdled cream sauce, the vegetable is a portion of suggestively presented broccoli sprouts, slivered in seawater and whipped mercilessly at your table. 
The quiche of the day is an eggless shaved... The, um, the quiche of the day? No, no quiche, just the quiche. Or the catch of the day? No catch, just quiche. Quiche? Quiche. Which old quiche? The wicked old quiche. <laughs> Ding dong. Who's on first? The quiche of the day? Actually, no quiche of the day, all out. Daylight saving time, you know. Quiche of the night, though. The queen of the night? And I'm the queen of the May. <laughs> May we continue? All right. <clears throat> Our fish dish this evening is a deeply masticated cod piece with an egregiously thick hollandaise sauce and pan-seared baby prunes served over a bed of arugula and baked dentures. For dessert, and I'm really excited about this one, a semi-sweet souffle of infant livers with imported wolverine urine and some fresh verbal abuse from our chef. Now, can I start you off with a preprandial potion, perhaps? A luscious liquid libation just before the lap dancing starts? Hello, how are you all tonight? My name is Annette and I would like to welcome you to our seminar on the art and science of narcissism. Tonight we're going to be talking about relationships. Now, how many of you are in a relationship right now? Let's see the hands. Okay, now how many of you have recently broken up with somebody? Okay, how many of you were broken up with? <laughs> Come on now, it's got to be one way or the other, right? Come on. That's more like it than a few hands now. After all, if there wasn't something wrong with you, you wouldn't be here tonight, would you? Oh, I'm here to convey that you've only got one hope, and that is to make superior people feel bad about being superior to you. It's not very hard. You probably do it all the time. What we got to get it down is systematization. Don't do anything but that. Practice in every situation you can when there's any trace of a power play going on. Don't let up. Now watch this. Waiting for someone? Could be. I just noticed you're buying your own drinks. Why? Does someone buy your drinks for you? From time to time. Well, what can I get you? You can get lost. Hey, honey, I hope you have one hell of an evening. You're so sweet. Sorry, but one can't be too selective these days. There. Who won that exchange? He wanted recognition, but she didn't give many. On the other hand, she's still alone, and he did manage to slip in that little bit about her temperament to try and make her feel unattractive. We all know that one, don't we? But she had the last word and she never let on that she needed anything off of him. So she wins. Okay, let's do it the other way around now. Hi, were you staring at me just now? Why, no, I'm uh, waiting for a friend. Oh, do you usually let guys stand you up this long? I've only been here waiting a few minutes. Besides, what's it to you? Not much. Well, so why don't you just piss off? Such language. What are you trying to do? Make me feel bad? No, I could have made you feel better, but I don't have that kind of time. All right, 
He was attracted to her, but he managed to win the encounter anyway. She wasn't very good at handling him, was she? Pretty wimpy, right? Just floundering around, losing her natural superiority because she couldn't handle the challenge. The best defense is a good offense. All right, we're going to really have you coping with adversity before this session is through. Um, now we want to talk about relationships. So what do we have to cope with here? Let's have some answers. Rejection. Rejection. Okay. Jealousy. Jealousy. Depression. Depression. Boredom. Boredom. Yes, boredom. Being bored with the person, having to hide it. <laughs> okay, far out, far out. Now, these things are all forms of failure as a person, right? We don't want to just cope. We want to win. And that means someone else has got to lose. And it's not going to be you, is it? No! Great. Far out. Jealousy. <laughs> Jealousy in a relationship means that one person has the other one psyched out. So what do you do about it? Okay, now I'm going to ask people to share their jealousy experiences with us. Okay, you. How did you handle it last time? What's your name? Mona. <laughs> <laughs> Mona. <laughs> Mona. Uh, share with us. Well, my husband started to, to see another woman, so I, I threatened to leave him. Did it work, Mona? Well, I did leave him, and now we're divorced. Not too bright, Mona. Look, the point isn't to be in the right. It's to beat your opponent. If you're jealous, the object is to break the double standard. If your opponent is jealous, your object is to enforce the double standard. Get it? Okay. Let's hear from somebody else. Yes? Yeah. My name's Albert, and I had this experience with this one woman lately. She was going out behind my back. All my buddies knew about it. They told me, man, you got to drop that bitch. So I did. But before I did, I screwed her best friend. Far out, Albert. Far out. Okay, that's a little more like it. I'm still looking for someone who's dealt with jealousy positively, though, uh, not letting it end the relationship. Oh, do I see a hand? Okay, share. Um, my name is Marjorie. My boyfriend and I still live together. We lived together for three years. Uh, two years ago, he cheated on me with this cheap little tart. I begged him not to. I tried everything. I got a new permanent. I made him his favorite dinner every night. I lost 85 pounds. I increased his allowance. But nothing helped. He kept seeing her. I just couldn't take it anymore. One afternoon I turned on the gas and just stuck my head in the oven. But they must have changed the kind of gas or something because I didn't die. I just got nauseous. So then I slashed my wrists and went and sat in the bathtub. And he came home, and it was a real mess. And then I found out I had inherited all my grandmother's money, and my boyfriend said he'd never cheat on me again. And he'd be here with me tonight, only he's decided to be a writer, and he has to travel a lot to get ideas for stories. All right. That's too much, Marjorie. Really too much. But I'm glad somebody finally brought up suicide as a tactic. It can be a good one if you know what you're doing. If you don't, naturally, you may wind up a loser and dead. With suicide, you've got to remember two things. One, be prepared to go all the way. And two, only try it once. You try it again, they're going to let you die. And if you don't really mean it, if you go about it in some amateurish, half-assed way, they just might help you along. No one likes someone who does things in an insincere way. Now, I'm going to share with you. You know, I have a relationship. And before I took the training, my boyfriend would get bored in our relationship sometimes. And then I'd get all uptight, and I'd start carrying on and crying. And I'd feel really down and everything. But after I took the training, after I took the training... Well, my boyfriend still gets bored, but it's okay with me. I just say to him, oh, far out, you're bored. That's really far out. 
well, <clears throat> the, uh, the session's almost over now, and I want to summarize some of what you should have picked up so far. First, when in doubt, don't feel anything. Second, don't just interact for free. Interaction is a service that people should pay for. Make sure you're getting a good price, or else people will start thinking, hey, how come so cheap? Third, don't let up and don't back down. If you're going to start doing things like seeing both sides of an argument, or feeling guilty, or doubting yourself, forget it. You're going to lose. Because if you aren't 100% behind yourself, who else is going to be? You claim your methods will help us get what we want, but they don't. Did I get what I wanted that night in the bar when the guy came up to me? No. I was lonely. I wanted to talk, to make someone feel good so that I could feel good. You ruined it. Yeah, th this is a bunch of crap. All you're saying is we should cut ourselves down to size. We should submit to the law of the jungle. Hmm. Well, how do you like that? You try to help people and they kick you in the teeth. The title of next week's seminar is going to be Don't Get Mad, Get Even. No, wait, ladies and gentlemen, wait, there's more to be said here. The young lady's right, but we have to get to the bottom of this. Leave no stone unturned if we want stones handy against the bird in the burning bush. You see, she doesn't go far enough. Interaction isn't just a service, it's an act of war. Every man's an island, but another man can call in an airstrike, just like Granada. Take out their command and control before they can toss a cocktail in your face. Leave them speechless. You see, World War III isn't against the Australians. I mean, not more than against anyone else. It's me, against the world, TNT for two, all against one and one against all. And the night shall be as Velcro, and the stars shall stick to the earth, and the diversified portfolios shall be a mighty fortress unto thy spirits, and the Doberman shall consume the poodle, and in turn be consumed by the great Dane unto the fifth generation." which shall be self-targeted with enhanced counterforce capability. This is no ordinary assault rifle, ladies and gentlemen. The clip holds 200 rounds of explosive bullets. Super scope accurate at 25 yards. Take out those annoying children instantly. Amaze your friends, not sold in any store. Cheerios. Howard Cosell. Fragmentation grenades. Human rights. Twinkies. Compulsory overtime. The Nielsen family. The Carter family. All in the family. Hamburger helper. Paul Malden. Network editorials. Rely tampons. The new Chrysler Corporation. The new Bob Dylan. Low tar, low fat, lowered expectations. Inner boxes. Famolares. Famous potatoes. Mutual funds. Mutual life. Mutual assured destruction. Love boat. Love canal. Singles bars. Ethnic purity. Key punching. BDTs. BTRs. BFWs. VIPs. Collection agencies. Microwave ovens. Designer jeans. Acid rain. Universal pictures. Universal price codes. Universal wage labor. Afro sheen. Well, Bright. Overkill. Peace through strength and death with dignity. Stop, Charles, whispered Linda drowsily. Then again more uh, urgently. urgently as his hand began to move almost r roughly under her silk blouse sliding up around her tanned shoe shoulder blades shoulder blades when's something going to happen something is happening go on and then forward tugging at the lace of her brass brazier brazier please stop you mustn't why not he breath breathed breathed in her ear, his voice ho -ass. Horse. Why is his voice a horse? Are there going to be more horses and guns? Finish the sentence and you'll find out. Horse with pa passion. You want it, I want it. I'm a man, you're a woman. Oh, Charles, my darling, you're so clever with words, but it's wrong, it's too soon. No, he snorted fiercely through clenched 
teeth as he gnawed gnawed tenderly on her ear lobe gnawed on her ear lobe that's horrid i've got a big one i'm tall i'm rich you're slim you're dumb you're ju ju i see juicy oh linda my cherry 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 enough of this coyness must i go on with this oh here let me his taut muscular body was stiff and firm against hers his smooth rigid arms held her clenched in an unbreakable embrace she felt herself melting into a sticky golden pool of incandescent longing as her whole body unfolded like a magnificent flower to receive the firm fierce thrust of his lips against hers i'm hungry where's my chop Hey, what you looking for? Looking for a hot time. What sort of hot time? What do you got? We've got the studge. Hot, hot studge? Hot Philboid studge. Philboid does studge? Give me a nudge. You call the judge, we got the studge. Hot as you can handle. Ooh. Philboid studge, sweeter than fudge. We won't budge till we get our studge. Philboid's the one. Philboy, Philboy, Philboy Studge, hot, hot, Philboy Studge. Below the sleepy coastal hills, nestled within the heart of the Silicon Valley, there sprawls the Generico Contact Corporation. And as the world wakes in wonder, another day begins for this vast computer network, this great throbbing machine composed of countless men and women whose triumphs and heartbreaks, whose ceaseless endeavors break forth the chips of our lives. Bill, Carol, I'm Dr. Farewell. Won't you come in and take a seat? Carol, that's it. Carol. Thank you, Dr. Farewell. Now, Bill, just open up. Tell me the problem in your own words. I'll translate. Well, Doctor, it seems that whenever I want a core dump, uh, she pushes me onto a stack. Uh-huh. Carol, I hear Bill saying that whenever he wants to talk, you're always too busy. Yeah. She's always home or child-enabled, you know, like interrupt-driven. He says you're always hectically preoccupied with household affairs and the kids. And when we find a window, well, the, the bandwidth is just too small. When you are together, you can't seem to communicate. My system memory just isn't designed for batch processing. By the time she's ready to load, my files are too big and buggy to compile. Uh -huh. I, I just crash on trivial errors. Mm. I hear Bill saying he has to wait too long to talk to you, so he has to hold on to too much inside and then blows up over little things. Doctor, the kids and I just want him home from work more often. We just. But honey, I installed a cellular phone in your wagon. <laughs> But that's off-site, Bill. Baud rate's not high enough. Too much noise in the link. Log on. We're talking quality access. Single mm. user mode. What are you saying to him, doctor? I'm letting Bill know that your minimum requirements are for him to spend considerably more time at home. Can you hack that, Bill? Hmm. How to spend more time at home while still... I could become a remote node on the contact network. All I need to do is write a synchronous dial-out callback protocol to please the guys in security, maybe even get them to dedicate a line into the LAN. Yeah! Otherwise, I can tweak one of the standard permits and then... <laughs> We're 
here in Berkeley, California at Edie's, one of the world's fine restaurants. We've secretly replaced the fine coffee they usually serve with Phil Boyd Studge. Will it be rich enough? Let's listen in to what the patrons are saying through our hidden microphones. The natural question, therefore, comes to the minds of many people. They say, well, aren't you in danger? Won't the communists try to get you? Cause maybe an accident? Maybe assassinate you? The answer to that question is simple. Yes, my life is in danger. Do I need to worry when I go to bed at night? Lest some communist agitator is lurking around the corner with a gun, with a knife, with a bomb. There you have it, another unsolicited testimonial for Phil Boyd Studge, rich enough to be served in America's finest restaurants. Hello, and welcome to another edition of On the Record. We'll be hearing several newly released recordings of classical music and hear them evaluated by our panel of distinguished critics. On this program, we have with us Mr. Gerhard Abskonsky of the New York Daily Journal and Mr. Hubert Puse of the Los Angeles Bladder. We'll begin with an excerpt from a new recording of Ravel's Bolero by the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra under the direction of Gleeford Zinn. Comments, gentlemen. We'll start with you, Mr. Abskonsky. Well, I'll, I'll have to say right off that I don't think the conductor, Mr. Zinn, has any understanding of the work at all. In fact, I highly doubt whether he's even bothered to look at the score. Th this is one of the most pathetic excuses for a bolero I've heard since the 1952 arrangement for a tuba quartet. Um, in my opinion, this record ought to be melted down for a toilet seat. Mr. Puse, would you agree with that assessment? With respect to my esteemed colleague, that opinion isn't worth a flatulent bag of balderdash. Any pick-faced twit can see that this is one of the most vibrant performances since the 1925 recording by, by Sir Balls Beecham. This performance has a, a piquant vivacity, which is matched only by its remorseless perspiration, uh, perspicaciousness. All right, thank you, gentlemen. For our second selection, Gunter Hus conducts the chorus and orchestra of Radio Leipzig in the Erbarmedisch from the German Requiem by Brahms. <laughs> Mr. Abskonsky, your evaluation of this recording? 
This is an absolute delight. That this performance is provocatively imbued with a formal simplicity held in check by an unwavering sense of expostulation, tonally speaking. I can't help but be reminded of Dogbert Engelbert Dink's uh, classic 1918 recording, uh, yet at the same time infused with a zeal of impestrous elegance, and though I may be accused of overlooking some minor aspects of bar-to-bar continuity, its overall orchestral fabric is far and away given over to the, uh, if I may say, the yes. post-Wagnerian overtones and its percussive organization. Yes. And even if posterity will permit... Yes, I, yes. Thank you, Mr. Abskonsky. Mr. Puce, your opinion. Well, painful as it may be, I must agree with my colleague on at least one or two initial points, but I'd also like to point out my marked enjoyment of the soprano section here, and on the record jacket, a, a particularly handsome group of female representatives, I must say, particularly enchanting, especially the one-third from the left in the tight... Moving on to the final selection for this program, Helmut Beans performs on the great organ of St. Agnes in the Wall Cathedral of Winnemucca, Nevada. We'll hear Bach's great prelude and fugue in G minor. <laughs> Mr. Abskonsky. I see you've saved the best for last. <laughs> I found this an extremely powerful performance. Such intensity. The vibrato was overwhelming. I find myself simply shaken to the very foundations by this performance. Oh, dear. I seem to have wet the chair. Yes, that, that's all right, Mr. Abskonsky. Someone will be in later to clean it up. Well, with all due respect to my esteemed colleague, who should certainly know better, only a git-nosed, polymorphous, geezer-like and boil-popping hippo ear dung barfer could find anything commendable in this positively prostituted desecration of the great Johann Sebastian Bach's sublime prelude and fugue in, in G minor. If I may say, this is a work I myself have performed many times during my years at the conservatory, and for that reason I suppose it's possible that I may be overcritical. But I was not amused by this horrid performance of one of my favorite works. Gentlemen, I must confess, we've played a little trick on you, inadvertently. That last selection we heard was not Bach's Prelude and Fugue in G minor, as I had announced. It was, in fact, Bach's Prelude and Fugue in C sharp minor. My apologies to you both. Well, uh, I... I, I that's yes, so that's wrong. Commodity Fetish Records presents a never-before-offered two-record package, the greatest hits of electronic music. Just listen to what you get. What tender memories you'll recall as you listen to Dieter Schnabel's Glusely. You'll thrill to Milton Babbitt's sentimental composition for synthesizer. (laughs) 
And who could ever forget? Come out to show them, 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 come out to show them. Yes, that's right. The entire thirteen minutes of Steve Reich's come out to show them. You also get this all-time favorite. John Cage's 20 minutes of uninterrupted silence. Some say his most inspired composition. Here at the Cultural Supermarket, there's no insult so low you won't find it on record. To order this amazing record package, just send 1999 to the greatest hits of electronic music. Box 000, Princeton, New Jersey. That's Box 000, Princeton, New Jersey. Little of intrinsic value, approximately class D minus on Richter's scale of cultures. Drive-In Radio Theater was written by Adam Cornford, Terry Hawkins, Michael Pepe, Melinda Gebby, and Janice Lieber. <laughs>